there is another question that we really need to answer. Um, is where the money comes from. So once you go through the certification process, what markets can you access and what do these markets look like and how do you access them? Plan Vivo is a certification standard uh, for community-based climate and ecosystem service programs. So it's largely focused on carbon but also looking at other emerging ecosystem service markets. We focus on communities and smallholders with very limited resources and access to resources so we try to make the standard cost effective in comparison to other voluntary carbon market standards. The need for Plan Vivo basically emerged with the understanding that most of us have that these ecosystem services are provided, many of ecosystem services are provided by rural communities, but at many times the reality is that these communities cannot access uh, the markets for ecosystem services. So there existed a need to link them or give them the opportunity to access international markets. Uh, for ecosystem services. That was the first Plan Vivo which was developed in the Skull LTA project and it's effectively at the local level a sustainable land management plan. It is not something with the foundation or the project coordinators dictate. It is developed by the community members themselves. It is like Richard said, a plan developed by community members. This is how we would like to sustainably manage our land and what finance can we access for these activities. Uh, there is an annual reporting system in place which gives the foundation oversight into the pro project's activities and which gives a sense of confidence and transparency to buyers. Um, there are a range of activities which can be certified under Plan Vivo and these are broadly categorized under ecosystem restoration, rehabilitation, prevention of ecosystem conversion and improved land use management. There are key uh, requirements across all inter interventions so for instance there the requirement to maintain or enhance biodiversity. For tree planting projects, for instance, Plan Vivo requires that you can only plant native or naturalized tree species. Uh, there are uh, strong requirements on the ownership or land use or rights for communities. Um, then the livelihood and socioeconomic impacts that the projects will accrue. Uh, and that the project should not have any other negative environmental uh, impacts and that just because you sequester carbon doesn't mean you can deplete the water resources. There was a question this morning about how do we ensure that there are safeguards to protect communities from being, um, um, for raising expectations and not meeting them effectively. The model how it works is there is a project coordinator like Pauline is a project coordinator and the coordinator enters into a payments for ecosystem services agreement with the community members. And at that point, once an agreement is signed, uh, the coordinator has to disperse, make these payments to communities. That's a requirement. So essentially what this means is uh, project coordinators try to get forward sales. So once you've got the uh, sales committed, you've, you can see the money in the trust fund, then you sort of sign uh, contracts. So that sort of safeguards community members from being misled. So basically what happens is we have the principle of aggregation. So you have many community groups or smallholders who engage in activities and the project coordinator aggregates the carbon or ecosystem benefits from these communities and are issued Plan Vivo certificates by us, the Plan Vivo Foundation. And it is at that point where you have a product and you have to sell the product and that's where people like Morton uh, come into the picture and support uh, these project coordinators to access markets beyond uh, their, their immediate markets. And mostly these certificates are bought by organizations as part of their CSR program. So just to look at these figures about per capita earnings, uh, these are rough averages, but it sort of gives, because we've been discussing a lot about the millions and billions which needs to go into the payments for ecosystem service markets. But what does it mean in the local level, at the micro level, at the smallholder level? So this gives you a picture of what a smallholder from sustainable land management on his own land might gain. So $1,000, it might seem not seem very material here, but I come from India, and if you translate this into Indian rupees, it's quite substantial, and it can really um, help you change your livelihoods and move into a more sustainable uh, livelihood uh, model. There is often uh, technical capacity constraints um, there are barriers to implementation like land tenure and so on. 
and upfront cost, as I mentioned earlier. So we often think that a small holder or a small area of land is not relevant in the larger context, but by aggregation, they can be uh, make a meaningful contribution to, to climate action. Sometimes the non-carbon benefits which these projects accrue in terms of poverty elevation or uh, other ecosystem service benefits, these are the key messages that buyers look for. How can we help secure funding for smallholders and, and community pests? Whether they're climate partners, we help them estimate their greenhouse gas emissions. It could be from their operations, it could be from their products. Um, and we try to use carbon offsetting as an incentive to decrease their emissions by introducing renewable energy and uh, efficiency improvements so that they over time uh, decrease their footprint. Just doing offsetting, in Sweden at least, and I think here too, is often seen as greenwash. So if you don't combine the three strategies, it's um, yeah, waste, a waste of money. The great thing about this business model is that very few customers quit. Once they start reporting and offsetting, they rarely quit. So uh, our customers stay on board uh, on average for at least five years, which is great it, uh, for, for, for us and for the projects. And we have also been successful with the food industry. I think the food industry, they, they know what's at stake with the diminishing uh, services coming out of ecosystems. That's where they earn their money. Um, so they, they realize what's at stake and they want to engage in, in protecting ecosystem, planting trees, sequestering carbon. So that's a tip for you out there who, who is going to self-focus on the food industry. You get a good response. This is fairly unfortunate, the market situation in the world that globally, I mean in Sweden, uh, we have a carbon tax and it's, uh, I think it hits 90 pounds, uh, which is good. <laughs> but globally, the carbon price is very low. Um, the last time I checked, it was below 20, 20 cents. And of course, not many projects get off the ground with 20 cents. So with this situation, um, having certificates on the market for 20 cents. Um, my, a lot of my customers, they call me once in a while and ask, oh, I got this offer, um, buying certificates for, for 50 cents or something. Why should I pay you 10 times more? Because we're trying to, um, yeah, we want to sell it at least seven, eight dollars or, or, or something like that. And we have this uh, tough competition and this spillover from the compliance market. The Swedish market is pretty good. Uh, nine out of 10 people know what carbon offsetting is, and this is not the fact in, in many other countries. So if you go out on the street, nine people out of 10 know what carbon offsetting is. So that's, that's good. When we asked the same question two years ago with our partner Novus, who did the survey, uh, only seven out of 10 people knew uh, what it was. So we follow up uh, with a couple more statements, and it turns out that six out of 10 people prefer to buy products and services from companies that show responsibility by reducing their greenhouse gas emissions. If I'm gonna elaborate on that, I think we can help by um, bundling environmental services and co-benefits with carbon in a more attractive way. We're, we already do that, but just listening today, it's, it's amazing to learn how, how trees really uh, affect and, and improve ecosystem. And when taking them away, it's so obvious that, that, that uh, they are very valuable. I don't think it's feasible at this stage, at, lo at least not in, in, on the Swedish market, to sell something else than carbon. I mean, you see that it's from Bolivia. It's the only thing that we actually can measure today. Uh, but of course, bundling these with uh, the other benefits of, of, of trees and, and forests, uh, we can certainly uh, charge a price, uh, price premium. When it comes to certifications and labels, I mean, it's, uh, usually it's uh, a lot of investments going into to, to these. But I think they are very important from a customer's point of view. They signal recognition. Often in this, uh, I mean, they, as in, in the Plan Vivo certification, they include transparency. You can see all the assumptions made and the calculations made and so on. So they, they create a sense of, of trust. And also I had a call this morning with a wine producer that wants to label their wine as a carbon neutral wine. And by doing that, they can uh, have a, a, a sign on the shelf 
on Systembolaget, which is the big monopoly in Sweden, so that the offer stands out uh, on the shelf. So by labeling, hopefully with our carbon offset label there, yeah, they can sell more wine. It's, it's the obvious uh, thing to do. In general, we have thought too little about sales. So we have to make sure that the projects out there develop a business plan from the outset and really think about who, who is the customer that are willing to buy this. This is not exact science. I mean, quantifying, quantifying benefits, even quantifying carbon. We think we can measure carbon, but really no. Uh, it's, it's really hard. A couple of the projects do really good selling themselves, I think. For example, the, the Limay Community Carbon, they have a, um, I mean, uh, they, they truly have a, a business plan, I think, and, and a diverse, um, many different resellers and, and so on. And selling directly, I wouldn't have anything against it. La península de Osa es una de las regiones de mayor biodiversidad de Mesoamérica. Desde el 2007, con el aporte financiero de Conservación Internacional y de Nature Conservancy, se apoya a propietarios de fincas privadas para acceder al Programa Nacional de Pago por Servicios Ambientales. De Servicios Ambientales ya todo cambió, tengo una vida diferente, la familia también, ya no tengo que estar maltratando la montaña, la cuido, ahí limpio los carriles, eh, la tengo en, en buen estado. Y aparte de, de la vida acá eh, eh, diaria, ha sido diferente. Seda Arena, con el apoyo del Global Conservation Fund, GCF, Conservación Internacional, CI y Conservación OSA, aportaron un millón de dólares al Fondo de Biodiversidad Sostenible para el pago de servicios ambientales y establecimiento de servidumbres ecológicas a largo plazo. Esto permitirá contribuir a la conservación de áreas clave en el corredor biológico OSA. El fondo se convierte como en la parte más importante de este proceso. Ya como que construimos toda la estructura inicial, pusimos el, el, el carrito a andar, pero la gasolina van a ser los fondos que va a generar eh, este fideicomiso. OSA es muy interesante porque... 20 years ago was really the focus of huge deforestation and illegal, um, and, and it, there were a lot of environmental problems. And now we have a mix of poor people with large farms, but they can't really do much with them. But also at the same time, we have a lot of foreigners coming to buy land there. Um, and we tend to have the case that it is the, the, the more vulnerable, vulnerable people that don't have property titles, and now with all this, um, there's a lot of problems with the cadastral maps and everything, and they can't really access the official program because of these um, legal restrictions. So the people who can actually access, a lot of the times is these foreigners who have bought the 30 hectares of beautiful land in there, and they come for the holidays, and they qualify for the priority, and they qualify for the small uh, property. The major part of them are small producers, small land owners. And some of them, they have this, this problem because they don't have, they have the property rights, but they don't have the title. Then the idea is, in the last years, FONAFI for reform, the, some of the um, requirements to access the program, and some land owners can access them if they have, they can prove that the land is of them. Ah, but uh, we can, you know, bring to witness the, to, to people who live around of the, of the, of the people who live in this area, um, they can access a, a, the payment in this new system. The idea is to, you know, to give more flexibility in the system. I'm going to be the heretic in the room. Is biodiversity an ecosystem service? Or is biodiversity, which is where I'm beginning to go, 
actually a characteristic of an ecosystem which enables an ecosystem to provide services. Because that conceptualization has huge impact on the way that we design a payment for ecosystem service. It means do we try to conserve biodiversity or do we, desert, or we try to promote, conserve, enhance the productivity of an ecosystem, looking at its biodiversity, um, in terms of the benefits and services provided to humanity. That difference actually is vast, and I see that in the, in the different research communities of different community, different development communities. That's a debate we really do have to have if we're going to get this innovation for payment for ecosystem services. We need to find what, what is this ecosystem service thing? The last bit was the question, how are you going to scale up so that in the future we don't need to give you the next 800,000, which is actually the hidden <coughs> funding which makes that investment possible. There's a lot of cross subsidization because that was the talk, that was the question that we had from a Swedish colleague. Mm -hmm. Are donors good or bad? Probably both. They've been very useful up to this point, but how do we wean payments of ecosystem services off the necessity for subsidy from the donor community so that they are self-funding and sustainable. And one of the challenges that we face is not only the technical ones, but also the mindset ones of we're, we're so used to working with grants that we're not really thinking like business people who need to take strong business plans. And we're sitting here thinking about how important business plans are, but we also need to cultivate that kind of thinking and and, and, um, and mentality amongst the communities we're working with and also the local partners that we're working with. And any lessons that you have on, on how you facilitate that shift in mindset would be very valuable because there's a macro question about the funding, but there's also a micro question about, about mindsets as well, I think. I think in so some of these pioneering innovative projects, you, can, you may need to invest a lot more. We want to, to, to make the, the project self-sustaining, but... Um, on the other hand, I have two, two, two objections or, or two, two, th two things that makes it a bit complicated. Um, on the one hand, the, the, the donor funding is sometimes seen by customers as a, as a label. and a, It's like if, if USAID has contributed to that project or still do, it's, 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 a, it's a recognition for, for me to also get involved as a private, uh, private actor. Uh, and also, sh should you f forbid projects to, to apply for donor funding if they see the possibility for making them better? Uh, fair trade was mentioned, and in fact, Fair Trade International is working on developing of a fair carbon standard now, and uh, one of the key components, but big discussions, <laughs> is on the minimum price. No? Uh, there will be a consultation uh, period, public consultation, I think in May of this year, so if you keep on touch on the website of Fairtrade International, you can comment on that. Mm. And it will be launched uh, yeah, next year, I think, in, in practice. No, uh, but Fairtrade is uh, teaming up with the gold standard. What we what we increasingly learning is that, you know, trust funds are not a panacea. They're not the solution by themselves. They are just enablers. They enable uh, to channel down resources to local communities. They uh, allow some transparency on how you manage resources, and they can also act as a buffer when there are short in, in shortfalls in the in the funding. It's clear that we have to really understand the value chain of ecosystem services. Who is part of that chain? What are the costs and 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 and, and benefits that are generated along the value chain, and what really trickles down to the level of the communities?